When society comes across true evil, its people breathe a sigh of relief when that evil is locked away, never to terrorize us again. But sometimes, evil is not so easily contained, and is instead loosed upon an unsuspecting world. I'm Andrew Boyd, and while I have been trapped here in this liminal space with nothing to eat but ectoplasm and my own hair for several weeks now, I have not yet totally succumbed to madness. In fact, I am so put together that I feel fully capable of telling you about the top five evil people who escaped from prison. Let us look into this abyss together and see the face of true evil. Number five, Randy Greenewalt and Gary Tyson. As a two for one bonus for our viewers, our first entry on this list details the imprisonment, escape, and brutal rampage of two prisoners from the Florence State Prison in Arizona, USA. In 1974, Randy Greenewalt and his brother James were held on suspicion for the murder of a truck driver named Stanley Sandage. The brothers had shot the driver and taken his wallet before being arrested when they tried to purchase stereo equipment with the victim's credit card. The authorities realized that the killing was extremely similar to the death of another driver, Henry Weber, four days earlier. The two brothers were charged with the murders, but Randy was able to avoid the death penalty by testifying against his brother. He was sent to Florence State Prison where he met Gary Tyson. Tyson had attempted to escape several times and was serving a life sentence for stabbing a prison guard. The two men formed a plan together to try and escape with the help of Tyson's three sons, who showed up to visiting day with a concealed shotgun and helped the two prisoners to overpower the guards and escape, with plans of escaping to a ranch in Mexico. They quickly ran into trouble when their car blew a tire. A kind stranger driving with his wife, infant son, and teenage niece came across them and tried to see if they needed help. They were taken prisoner by the convicts and taken into the desert where they were shot and left for dead, while Greenewalt and the Tysons fled in the family's Mazda. They made contact with a woman Greenewalt had become pen pals with, who bought them a truck and ammunition, plans of making their way to an airplane that Gary had chartered for their escape. The police caught wind of this, and the gang was forced to try and make alternate arrangements. They made their way to Texas, where they killed a couple of new weds and took their car. Days later, they were met with a roadblock, which they ruthlessly barreled their way through, before being met with another one six miles down the road. The officers opened fire on the gang, hitting one of the Tyson sons who was driving. The remaining two brothers and Greenewalt were captured, but Gary Tyson got away, although he was found dead in the desert eleven days later, having died a slow death of exposure to the elements. The brothers were sentenced to life in prison, and Gary was executed by lethal injection after spending two decades decades on death row. Number 4. Lida Southard, The Black Widow While not all marriages end well, and some can accurately be described as unmitigated disasters, few have ended as poorly as the various marriages of Lida Southard. But for all her faults, no one can say she didn't take the vow of tell death do us part seriously. Lida married her first husband, Robert Dooley, in the year 1912. For a while, it seemed a good match, with Dooley's brother Edward joining them on their ranch in Twin Falls, Idaho and the couple having a daughter named Lorraine two years later. When she was a year old, Lorraine suddenly died, having apparently drunk tainted water from a dirty well. Tragedy struck again later that year, when Edward died of food poisoning. Two months after that, Robert died of typhoid fever, and Lida was left the only surviving family member. Fortunately for her, she had taken out life insurance policies on each of her family members, and had over $4,500 to try and start over after this tragedy. She soon married William G. McCaffle, becoming the stepmother to his three-year-old daughter. When his daughter fell ill and died, the couple decided to move to Montana together, but within a year, William died of influenza, leaving poor Lida a widow once again. Bad luck seemed to follow her wherever she went, with her next husbands, Harlan C. Lewis and Edward F. Meyer, both dying of sudden illnesses within four months of marrying Lida. A relative of her first husband started to notice the pattern and had his family's corpses exhumed and examined, proving that all had died of arsenic poisoning. The other bodies showed the same results when tested, and Lida was arrested before she had a chance to murder her fifth husband, Paul Southard, for the insurance money. She was sentenced to ten years to life in the old Idaho State Penitentiary, where she remained as a model prisoner for the next ten years. The guards eventually stopped watching her as closely as they should have, and in 1931 she managed to remove a bar from her prison window and use her bedsheets to construct a rope in order to escape. She remained at large for over a year until she was found in Topeka, Kansas, married to her sixth husband, Harry Whitlock. 
She was taken into custody for another 10 years before being released in 1941. She died of a heart attack in 1958, whereupon her seventh husband, Hal Shaw, likely breathed an unconscious sigh of relief. Number 3. Nikolai Dzumagaliev, the Metal Fang Nikolai was born in 1952 in the Soviet Union. He went to railway school before being conscripted into the Soviet Army. After his service ended, he tried to go to university or become a driver, but failed at both. He worked various odd jobs, including that of a sailor, a forwarder, an electrician, a bulldozer operator, and a firefighter. He spent a lot of this time fantasizing about and planning murders, committing his first in 1979 on a woman he had encountered traveling across a rural path. He committed five more murders that year, whose victims he then cannibalized, and may have committed more if not for the fact that one night he got extremely drunk and accidentally shot one of his co-workers. He was arrested, diagnosed with schizophrenia, and sent to a mental institution. He was released less than a year later and he resumed his murders, committing two more. His ninth murder is what resulted in him being captured, as he had invited guests over to his home. He brought one of the guests into a different room, killed them, and began dismembering them with an axe. The other guests walked in on this and fled the scene before calling the police. They came to get him but were so shocked at the sight of him that he managed to escape before being captured the next day. He was declared insane and incarcerated in a mental hospital where he remained for the next eight years. In 1989, while being transferred to a different hospital, he managed to hijack the vehicle and escape. He was able to avoid capture for two years, killing at least one more person while at large, before he allowed himself to be caught stealing sheep. His hope was that he would not be recognized and could go to jail for a relatively minor offense. The story he gave the officers didn't add up, and a colonel familiar with the case was sent to check the situation out. He identified Nikolai, and he was sent back to a mental hospital where he remains to this day. Number 2. Ted Bundy The most well-known of the monsters on this list, Ted Ted Bundy was a cold-hearted murderer who would feign injury in order to get close to women and then attack them into unconsciousness in order to take them to a secondary location where he would take advantage of them before strangling them to death. He would often return to the bodies of the victims where he would subject the corpses to further indignities before decomposition made this impossible. He later confessed to 30 murders, but the authorities believe his real body count is likely extremely larger. In one of the first examples of computers being used to investigate serial killer crimes, authorities compiled all the information they had based on witness statements to come up with likely suspects, and the computer produced a list of 26 names, one of them Bundy's. At the same time, detectives made a list manually of their 100 best suspects. When Bundy's name appeared on both lists, he became their number one suspect, but word came out that he had already been arrested. A highway patrol officer had seen Bundy cruising a residential area and fleeing upon seeing the police car. When searched, they found a crowbar, handcuffs, a ski mask, rope, and an ice pick, among other suspicious items in Bundy's car. He was soon linked to and found guilty in a kidnapping case until the authorities gathered more evidence to charge him with the murders. In Utah State Prison, he attempted an escape and was placed in solitary confinement for several weeks before being transferred to Garfield County Jail. He was then taken to the Pitkin County Courthouse, where he chose to act as his own attorney. This allowed him to avoid having to wear handcuffs and shackles, and during a court recess he was allowed into the court library to research his case, where he snuck away from his guards and fled through the library window. He made his way to an aspen hunting cabin, which he broke into and stole food and a rifle from. He became lost in the mountains and eventually found his way back to Aspen, where he stole a car but was soon apprehended by authorities. He was sent back to prison where he acquired a hacksaw blade and spent six months sawing a hole in the bars in his window. He squeezed through the gap and into the crawl space, which led to the chief jailer's apartment where he stole clothes and walked right out the front door. During the two months of freedom following his second escape, Bundy managed to kill two sorority girls and one 12-year-old girl before eventually being arrested for driving a stolen car near the Alabama state line and being sent back to prison where he remained until his eventual execution. Number one. Earl Nelson. When Earl Nelson was two years old, his parents died and he was sent to live with his grandmother and her two younger children. Even from his young childhood days, he exhibited self-loathing and morbid behavior, being expelled from his primary school as a seven-year-old. He got even worse after being hit by a streetcar and being knocked out for almost a week. Upon awakening, he began to suffer from intense headaches and memory loss, and his behavior became more and more erratic. 
He was in and out of prison as a young adult for relatively minor charges such as trespassing and larceny. He eventually ended up in Los Angeles County Jail, where he remained for five months before escaping and joining the Navy. He was committed to the Napa State Mental Hospital by a Navy psychologist who described him as living in a constitutional psychotic state. The doctors at the institution described him as suffering from hallucinations and paranoid delusions, but they deemed him relatively harmless. In his time at the hospital, he managed to escape three times, causing the staff to nickname him Houdini and eventually stopped searching for him. He was sent back to the hospital after trying to assault a minor, but escaped two more times, before eventually being discharged in 1925. The next year, he began his string of murders. He would travel the country, pretending to be a harmless traveling Christian, looking for women with rooms to rent. He would then be invited into the women's homes, whereupon he would assault and murder them by strangling them. Not always in that order. A witness who saw him near the scene of the crime described him as a dark and stocky man with long arms and large hands, causing the newspapers to begin calling Earl Nelson the Gorilla Man, or the Dark Strangler. He managed to cross the country, killing at least 16 women, as well as two of their children, before making his way to Canada to avoid the growing manhunt. While in the country, he killed two more people before authorities were able to track him down and arrest him at a nearby train station. He escaped from the prison that very same night and boarded a train going south back into the States. The train happened to be carrying several members of the local police force who recaptured him and took him back to prison. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Although he tried to appeal this for reasons of insanity, he was hanged in Winnipeg in early 1928 at the age of 30 years old after killing at least 23 people and having a escaped incarceration on seven separate occasions. With that, another list has come to an end. Any other evildoers who managed to escape their prisons to wreak more havoc? Let us know in the comments below. The dark forces that keep me prisoner here in this lifeless void have requested that I remind you to like and subscribe so that they can more easily find you should they decide to capture you as well and force you to host videos about the macabre and the disturbing here on Top 5 Scary Videos.